Vestavia, and um, ask that you pray for me at the time I stand before you, and appreciate this opportunity to be here. Uh, do any of you this morning, I'll admit that I do, do you ever feel like sometimes you're the only one left, <laughs> like like a, the last of a dying breed? <laughs> you know, I'm only 31, but I, sometimes I feel like I'm just out in the wilderness alone, or Gary and I are just going at it, and, and other people don't want to parent like we want to parent, or... Or, you know, people, I'm sure we feel like um, we see churches that are 30, 40,000 people in Birmingham and, and we, can, we muster up maybe 100 some Sunday and we feel like, what's wrong with us? <laughs> uh, you ever feel that way? Um, do you ever feel, I, I know if any of you have watched the news, you feel like, wow, <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I mean, well, I won't say that, but it just, you just feel alone, don't you? <laughs> And sometimes you feel scared. Um, the, your, your family, your friends don't have the same worldview you have. Does anybody feel like this? Or y'all just think, that's just me. If it's just me, I'll preach to myself. Um, but I feel that way. Um, sometimes you even feel like giving up. Sometimes you feel like everybody in the world is against you <laughs> and what you stand for. And, and if you feel that way, I want to say you're in good company. <laughs> Because God's people have felt like that throughout all the ages. Amen. All the ages, God's people have felt like that. Um, the, it's, it's been true of God's people throughout all the ages. And I, I want to look at, at three things that, that I believe that all of God's people have faced from time to time. And three things that we really face uh, right now. And, and, and I want to look at it. And then I think the Bible gives us an example of how we're to react to these. Um, and the first one, Brother Sam prayed about it. Uh, is, is really oppressive governments. You know, God's people have been under oppressive governments from, from, day, from, from day one, right? The church grew out of Rome, which was an oppressive government. Uh, really, America has been uh, something that, that was really the first of its kind, right, with the religious freedom. And, and I told Kerry the other day, you know, the way it's going, we, may be, we escaped religious persecution, and we may be the first generation that sees religious persecution, Right? Um, we may be the first one that sees it in America. Uh, but, but God's people, you're not alone. You're in good company. <laughs> God's people, uh, the church is filled uh, with, uh, there's a book that I've read called The Trail of Blood. <laughs> it's been a bloody um, church all through the ages. People that, that cling to the doctrines of grace and the truth of Jesus Christ have, have faced persecution um, that, we, that we can't even imagine. All the apostles were martyred. Uh, John was sent to the Isle of Patmos. I mean, Christianity is not for wimps, right? <laughs> it's not for wimps. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3. And, and, and the three stories that I want to look at, you should all be, uh, you're probably all familiar with. And this one is, is Nebuchadnezzar, and he has set up a golden image of himself. And, and he, he makes this decree, uh, and this, this would be a, looking at oppressive governments. He makes this decree, and in Daniel chapter 3, uh, it says, a herod, in, in verse 4, a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Um, now we really, I don't know in America if we're going to see somebody set up a golden image to themselves, although Donald Trump does have quite a personality, so who knows. Um, that we have to fall down and worship, right? Uh, but we do have to fall down and worship things that people say to fall down and worship, right? I just got back from New York City, and it's a great place to visit. <laughs> but it was good to be back in Alabama. I've never been in a restroom before with a big sign on the front that says, you choose your gender. <laughs> if you're a man or a woman, you can use this restroom. And I've been a little out of place. I thought, and people think Christians are dumb, Right? People think Christians are dumb, and they can't even figure out which gender needs to use which restroom. If you don't know, if you're confused, I can tell you. There's an easy test I can tell you after church. Um, but here I am. They're saying, bow down to this, right? Gender identity. you got to bow down to gender identity. Homosexuality. Abortion. Did y'all see, I mean, the debate the other day? Abortion is just being pushed in our country, right? And, and the government's saying, bow down to this and bow down to that. And here's what they do. Look at verse 6. It says, And whoso falleth not down and worship shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, all these musical instruments, all the people 
the nations and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Uh, there's, a, there's a system, there's, there's something um, that governments do to get you to fall down, and, it's, and we see it in verse 6 and verse 7, and it's the threat of persecution and the threat of peer pressure. <laughs> it's been throughout all ages, right? If you don't do it, we're going to persecute you, and everybody else is doing it. Have you ever heard that before? Everybody else is doing it, so you might as well do it. Brother Sam before has said that um, that's one thing that never goes away, right? Peer pressure. He said he, they interviewed that 90-year-old woman on TV, and they said, what's the best thing about being 90-year-old? She said, no more peer pressure, <laughs> right? But if you're in school, you're facing peer pressure, right? If you're at work, you're facing peer pressure. And the media would have you to believe that everybody thinks the way that they believe, right? That's not true, folks. There's a lot of good people left in America, I do believe. But here we see that they have the fear of persecution and peer pressure. And we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, are three people that have been taken out of their land. Uh, they've been put in this Babylonian captivity. Uh, they're, they're taught to be like Babylonians and all these things. And so, and so they've got a decision to make. Are we going to bow down to this golden image? Are we going to give in to the ways of the world? Or are we going to stand for what's right? And what do they do? We all know what they do, right? They stand for what's right. That's our example. When, when, when the government is, is, is oppressing you, when, when the government says you need to do things that you shouldn't do, uh, we need to know that we serve the true and living God, right? Uh, not, not something that comes out of Washington, D.C. or Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, we serve the true and living God, and we need to stand uh, for what's right. You know, the, you know John the Baptist uh, was, was murdered uh, was killed for what? <laughs> for ter telling Herod he shouldn't marry somebody, right? For marriage. <laughs> uh, that we may see that again. People being killed for saying you shouldn't marry this type of person, right? We may see that again. Well, here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They've got to make a choice of what they're going to do. And what do they do? They stand up and they don't bow down. And so we all know the story. Um, and starting in verse 19, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, when he got word of this, he was full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. So we see that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have chosen the right way. <laughs> they've, 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 they've stood up to this oppressive government, and they're facing persecution, are they not? They're thrown into the fire. And if you ever think the, the Bible's boring, that's not a boring story, is it? <laughs> um, the other day, Evie Grace said, I want to hear a story about a witch. Uh, so I went to the, the story where Samuel goes to the witch at Endor. <laughs> and then the Bible talks about wizards. And she said, like the wizards of Oz? <laughs> um, the Bible's interesting, folks. <laughs> and if we don't read it, we will we'll forget that it's so interesting, right? So here they're thrown into the fiery furnace. And, and what, they, what they remembered that we forget, when we see and we think there's no hope for America, there's no hope for us, is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't forget that God is on their side. That's, what I'm, that's the point I'm trying to get today. Uh, the country may be going in the wrong direction, but God's still on our side. <laughs> right? They may not be on our side, but God is on our side. In verse 24 it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, that means astonished and alarmed, and rose up in haste, and spake and said unto the counselors, Did not we cast three men into the midst of the fire? He's saying, what's going on here? Then answered they and said, true, O king, we put three of them down there. And he answered and said, lo, I see four men loose. <laughs> Listen to our God, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. <laughs> Listen, we shouldn't fear what men can do to us because God's on our side, right? That's better than Fox 6 being on your side, isn't it? God's on our side. Amen. God's on our side. So when oppressive governments want to, want, to, want to tell you what to do, what to think, just stand up to them and say, Jesus is on my side. <laughs> and whatever happens to you, whether you're thrown in the middle of the fiery furnace, Jesus is there with you. The Bible says there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You know who that is? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Isn't that good to know this morning? <laughs> that Jesus Christ will stick with you. So the first thing that I see that, that we face, and we, we're facing it, folks. Make no mistake about it. Um, we are in a post-Christian nation. 
a post-Christian nation. Now, we're guarded because we're in Alabama, right? <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Thank God we're in Alabama. Um, but we're in a post-Christian nation. And, and, if, and if you don't believe me, just turn on the news, <laughs> right? That's all you got to do. The second thing that we face today that people have faced throughout all the ages God's people have faced is fear, right? Fear. And fear is the opposite of faith. Uh, but we all face fear. I want to look at a story where God's people were, were afraid and the proper response to that fear. If you will, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. This is another story that I hope you're all familiar with. Um, the, the God's people have gathered um, to fight the Philistines, and, and they've brought out a giant named Goliath. And he says, I want you to bring one of your men uh, to fight me, and whoever wins will win, right? <laughs> uh, bring somebody out to fight me. In verse 11 of 1 Samuel chapter 17, it says, When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. <laughs> they were scared. <laughs> now, do y'all get scared from time to time? <laughs> I do. We all have giants in our life, right? Sometimes the checkbook just it, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't have much in it. You get afraid, don't you? Where's, where, where's the money going to come from? Sometimes... It, it, there's just I could go on and on. We all have giants in our life, and and if you keep reading, David is sent. Um, his brothers are at this battle, and he's sent with some food to them. And and in verse um, 24, it says, "All the men of Israel, when they saw the man Goliath has come back out, they fled from him and were sore afraid." And in verse 25, it says, "And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel has he come up." And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and shall make his father's house free in Israel. Saul's getting desperate. <laughs> He's saying, we've got to go on out of business sale, man. Everything we got is somehow go fight this giant. <laughs> He's scared, right? And David spake up. Here's the proper response to fear. David spake to the men, stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that kills the Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? There's no fear in our life that should defy us because we've got God on our side, right? Verse 28 says, And Eliab, the eldest brother, heard he speak unto the men, and his anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why did you come down here? With, uh, why comest thou down here? And with whom hast thou left the few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thy heart, for thou come down that thou might see the battle. And then David says something that we all need to remember when we're scared to stand for God, when we're scared to, of what's going to happen. David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? <laughs> Is there, isn't, that a great, isn't that a great answer to his brother? Is there not a cause? <laughs> You know, maybe we shouldn't even go to church this morning. Church is dying in America. The church is not growing. Is there not a cause? <laughs> right? Um, maybe I shouldn't walk the ways of God. Is there not a cause? Just remember that. Is there not a cause? A great answer from David. In verse 32, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go to fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him. Thou art but a youth, and he's a man of war. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. Now look, look, where, look where his strength's coming from. There came a lion and a bear. See, you think the, the Bible's boring? Listen to this. There came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him <laughs> and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. <laughs> That's pretty cool, isn't it? Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. And David knew where his strength came from, and this is the proper response. David said, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with you. <laughs> uh, what's your giant in your life? I mean, are you in a relationship you need to get out of? <laughs> uh, um, 
Are you in a job you need to get out of? Or you, or you need to love your wife more than you, you're loving her? <laughs> love your husband more than you're loving him? Uh, whatever it is, the Lord can deliver you, right? But you've got to look to the Lord. <laughs> you, they were all looking to themselves. And here comes this fear. And they, they were just shaking and said, I'll give you anything. Somebody go fight him. Well, he says, I'm going to go out there and do it because the Lord will deliver him in my hands. And then he takes five stones, puts them in a bag, takes a slingshot, and knocks him right between the eye. The first shot takes his sword and cuts his head off. <laughs> That's a cool story, isn't it? And David didn't do that in his own strength. David did that to the strength of God. So fear's not, fear shouldn't be anything. The only thing we should fear is God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. <laughs> That's what we ought to fear as Christians, right? I know this is hard to do. It's easy to preach, hard to do. But I need it. I hope you need it. So whatever giant's in your life, don't fear. God's on your side. And the third thing that I know we face is um, negative people. <laughs> Y'all ever face negative people? We can't do that. We can't do this. <laughs> There's no sense in doing that. There's no sense in doing this. I, I tried to preach a couple of weeks ago on um, Matthew chapter 16. And, 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 and I said there's, there's two groups of people you need to stay away from. The they-sayers and the naysayers. Because they're both going to bring you down. <laughs> As, you know, who do men say that I am? Well, some say you're Elias. Some say you're John the Baptist. Well, it doesn't matter what people say. My dad's back there. He used to tell me growing up, uh, they say are the biggest liars you'll ever meet. <laughs> right, well, they say this is cool. They say that's cool. It's not, right? So stick away from the, nays- the they sayers and the naysayers. <laughs> There's some negative people in your life, and you really don't need a lot of negativity in your life, right? The world's bad enough. In, in, in Numbers chapter 13, another story I think you'll be familiar with um, Moses gathers some people together to go spy out the land that had been promised to them by God. And they go, and it says in verse 26, and they came to Moses and Aaron. This is the group of, of spies, and they're going to give their report. And to all the congregation of the children of Israel, <clears throat> under the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them, and unto all the congregation that showed them and showed them the fruit of the land. Now, this is a place where it took two men to carry grapes back, right? This is a good place that God said, I'm just going to give it to you. These are the same people that have been brought out miraculously from Egypt, right? <laughs> um, he says, they showed them the fruit of the lamb, and they told them and said, We came unto the land where thou sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, here's these naysayers, right? Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, and the Amalekites dwell in the land to the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast. And Caleb, he stood up and stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go at once. Now Caleb had a good attitude, didn't he? Let us go at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. But the man went up with him and said, We be not able to go against the people, for they are stronger than we. <laughs> what did they do? They forgot about God, didn't they? You go over to chapter 14. <laughs> and listen to the children. These are the children of Israel who were in slavery to the Egyptians. Um, just in bondage. And in verse 2 it says, And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses against Aaron and the whole congregation said unto them would God that we had died in the land of Egypt or would God we had died in this wilderness wherefore hath the Lord now they're blaming God brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be praying you know it's a good example a lot of times our natural reaction is just to blame God right it makes us feel better I think just to blame God were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. <laughs> and Moses and Aaron fell on their face before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. That's our natural bent, right? Just to become negative. Well, murmur against Moses. Well, it's the preacher's fault we're not growing. <laughs> he ought to be out there evangelizing everybody. <laughs> I got to work and watch TV. <laughs> I don't have time for that, right? He ought to be praying. He ought to be doing more. That's our natural bent, isn't it? Why aren't they doing this or they doing that? 
you know, I, I, um, I run our Facebook page, and I was off Facebook for a long time, and I was using my wife's account when I created that, and I tried to post things from time to time, and one day I got, I got in this mood. I said, we got, these bunch of people from the church don't even like our page, <laughs> Gary. I mean, come on, that's the least you can do, is just like our Facebook page, right? Come on. I mean, I'm just complaining. And then I go to, I said, I'm going to invite everybody I know to like our, our Facebook page. You can go in, you know, and invite people. I hadn't liked the page. <laughs> there I am complaining about something I hadn't done, right? We're just grown to complain and moan and groan. We forget about the Lord. Listen to what Caleb and Joshua. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of, you figured out, which were of them, searched the land, rent their clothes. They spake unto all the company, the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search is exceeding good. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. They said, If God's on your side, you can do it, right? If God's on your side, you can do it. David, Joshua, Caleb, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they all remembered what we often forget is that God is on our side, right? <clears throat> There's a, a quote I often think about. It says, your uplook determines your outlook. <laughs> if you're looking around at this world, you're going to get depressed, Right? <laughs> Um, if you're looking around to yourself for help, you're going to get depressed. <laughs> um, if you're looking around at your situation, you hang around those people that say, well, it can never, this can't ever happen or that can't ever happen. There's a quote by Henry Ford that says, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. I like that one, don't you? Whether you think you, some people, some people, I've been around them, the church just ain't going to survive in America. Well, if you got that kind of attitude, it's sure not going to survive, right? Well, there's no sense in doing this. The church is not going to survive. You know, I, I, I started attending, well, I've, been a, I've, I've attended Primitive Baptist churches for most of my life. When I really got involved uh, with the church was when I was in school in Tuscaloosa, and I went to a church that, that had, it started with eight members when this pastor took over, and he had a can-do attitude, right? <laughs> Y'all all know what I'm talking about, Bethlehem Primitive Baptist Church, and now it's just blossomed. You know, he didn't, he didn't go down there and think, well, I'm just going to pastor him and, you know, we'll wait till we die. No, he had a can-do attitude, right? His, his uplook determined his outlook. He had a vision for that. And that's what we need to have, right? We don't need to get caught up in the day-to-day -day activities. Uh, let's turn to John chapter 16. And I'll leave you with this. Jesus says these words in verse 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. That's good news, isn't it? I hope, I hope it's been a blessing.